Welcome to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. I'm Mike Waters. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by ESPN broadcaster and Syracuse alum, Sean McDonough. I talked with Sean about a recent surprise dinner held for now-retired SU basketball coach Jim Beheim. Sean described how he was a part of the diversion that kept the dinner a secret from Beheim, and also how the dinner became a roast of the Hall of Fame coach. Welcome back to another edition of the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. And today's podcast uh, should be a whole lot of fun uh, for the topic, and we'll get to that in a minute, but also for our guest, um, who's one of the funniest, smartest, uh, most you know, clever announcers. And I use clever um, with, with purpose because I think on your feet, on the air, in real time, if you're going to be smunny, funny or smart, you're clever. Um, so I've known this guy for a long, long time, and I'm happy to have him on the podcast. Uh, Syracuse alum and esteemed broadcaster, Sean McDonough. How are you, Sean? I'm all right. I will try to be clever and funny and smart on your podcast. Nice to see you, Mike. Hey, listen, I'll just take one of the three and we're good to go. So you pick uh, and we'll be fine. But uh, this is a, a sped up version of the podcast. I was, uh, before we started recording, I think I reached out to you less than an hour ago uh, to see if I could get you on sometime. And you said, basically, after a few back and forth, how about like now? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I get busier here as time goes along with college football starting up and baseball season still going on, a few other things. So uh, you happen to catch me at a good time. And as I said, I'm always happy to chat with you. So here we are. Well, and the reason why I reached out is I, I saw, you know, a few mentions on Twitter, a few places on Facebook where people were talking about this a dinner in Rochester at Oak Hill Country Club this past week. And I, I, it was sort of in, it was in honor of Jim Beheim, but I'm not sure if he knew about it ahead of time. You're, you're going to have to explain the, the event to me to start with. Well, it was a surprise roast, I guess you would call it, and tribute. You know, it was largely a roast, but there were an awful lot of really heartfelt, emotional, nice comments directed toward Coach as well. You know, when I first heard about this months ago, Bobby Sansone, who's a great guy, lives out in Rochester, and is a dear friend of Coach Beheim. you know, he had the idea, you know, after Coach retired, there really wasn't anything, and I'm sure the university at the right time will do the appropriate tribute, but, you know, it had been several months now and there hadn't really been anything of this sort. So he had the idea to put together a surprise roast with about 500 people in attendance. So I thought it was going to be very hard to pull that off, given how many people who are close to coach knew about it. And, you know, some of us were coming from other parts of the country. So, but he, Bobby pulled it off. Um, you know, we, PJ Carlissimo and I were kind of the diversion in the afternoon. Coach thought he was coming to Oak Hill to meet some potential, you know, donors. And uh, and it turns out uh, instead there were about 500 of his friends and admirers. So when we walked into the big room there, they had a beautiful kind of indoor tent off the back of Oak Hill. Uh, he was completely surprised. He had tears in his eyes and he was very moved by the, you know, instantaneous standing ovation from all those people who were there, which was the first of many on the night. So it was a really fun night. A lot of great speakers. Not I was not one of them. I was one of the speakers, but not one of the great ones. And there were other people who were smart and funny and clever. But a great <laughs> night. I know Coach was very touched by it. He, I texted back and forth with him the next day, and he said it was the best tribute any coach ever got. So you know, he was really moved by it, and I know Julie was too, and his friends and family and uh, I think all of us were there. It was it was very funny. It was very heartfelt. It was everything you kind of want one of those things to be. So how did you and PJ serve as the diversions? Uh, we met him at a place down the street with Bobby. He didn't even know we were coming. I thought the surprise would be blown right then, right? Because we were sort of like, well, I thought Coach would say, what are you two doing here? So we sort of said that we, you know, it was lame, but he, I guess he felt for it that we were here to help him, you know, schmooze a couple of potential NIL people, um, which obviously uh, turned out not to be true. 
as PJ said, we weren't even there for the roast. He and I were there because it was a chance to play at Oak Hill uh, during the, the afternoon of the roast. Uh, PJ said the two of us, actually, if we could have gotten a flight out, would have left before having to say nice things about Mr. Happy Coach. But we did stay for the event. But uh, we were the diversion. And then Bobby Sansone drove the three of us down the street to uh, Oak Hill. And as I said, when we walked in, it was really one of the cool moments because, you know, Coach isn't really the, the weepy. And he didn't sob, but, I mean, he his eyes filled with tears. Julie was standing right there. PJ Carlissimo was one of Coach's best friends. Uh, he was very emotional. And, you know, we all were. I was, too, just to see – you know, how much it meant to coach to to see so many people gathered there to pay tribute to him. Was Julian on it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, matter of fact, uh, I'm sure she was asked many times, is this really still a surprise? Because they've been going on for months. And they had to change the date one time, uh, which was also tough to do with that many people involved because coach had something else. On the same day, it was originally supposed to be, I think, on the, the Thursday, and we had it two days earlier instead. So that required a lot of moving around. But it was we didn't say to him, no one said to him, hey, you have to show up on the Thursday because there's 500 people coming. So, you know, that required some maneuvering as well. But I asked Jerry McNamara and Adrian, some of the other guys who were there, like, is he really going to be surprised by this? And I said, yeah, he apparently doesn't know anything about it. And it was obvious when he walked in. He didn't know anything about it. He said as we were walking in, he had a little bit of an inkling that something might be up, but that was the first time that he had really thought that. You know, it's interesting that you it wasn't, I mean, it was a tribute dinner, but you said it was also sort of a roast. Now, I've watched many a roast on Comedy Central, and I can go back, way back uh, for the roast, like the Dean Martin roast. Right. Usually the roastee is aware that it's a roast in advance and they've prepared themselves for some of the stuff. Uh, gonna... Well, as you know, he he doesn't need much time to speak <laughs> uh, viciously about his friends. So, um, you know, he yeah, I, you know, he had a lot of time while he was sitting there to think of what he wanted to say, because PJ and I started it. We were sort of the the co-MCs of the first half of it, which was mostly the roast part. And then, um, you know, but Gary, I'm trying to think of the order. Rick Pitino spoke, Gary Williams, uh, Mike Fratello, and PJ and I kind of went back and forth in between, and we do a little bit more of our own shtick and then introduce the next person. And then um, Adrian Autry spoke, Eric Lottenbach from Grin Nike Basketball for a long time, who you know is a really dear friend to coach. He was yeah. the most emotional of the speakers. He he was very emotional talking about how much coach meant to him. And then uh, and then we brought up Mike Tirico at, toward the end to MC sort of the, the, the classy and nice part of it because PJ and I are incapable of classy or nice. So <laughs> Mike came up and, and did his thing and introduced coach and – said a lot of nice things about Coach before he brought him up. And so then, you know, Coach, while everybody was talking, I'm sure was making mental notes. And he, when he spoke, it was as if he had known this was happening because he, he was quite funny and, and also very heartfelt as well. So I don't know how it could have been any better. You know, we, PJ and I were kind of, we got there, we were sort of Bobby Sansone basically, you know, just do whatever you want. So we're like, okay, we knew it was a roast and so, you know, when we got to the end of our comments, after we had done the roast part, before I sat down, I did my nice, part, you know, all the things that I appreciate about him. And uh, there are a lot of those. You know, as I said at the dinner, I, I, you know, I admire that he's a great family person. He's a great husband and has a great wife, obviously, and Julie. He's a great dad. You know, Mike, how much he loves his kids. Yep, um, I, I, I admire his love of Syracuse, Central New York, Syracuse University. You know, my dad used to say a great person has great friends. He has some amazing friends. It's one of the blessings for me, having been close to him all these years. I've met a lot of people who are now some of my closest friends through him. I know, you know, Jim and Peggy Carrick, who are season ticket holders and very involved in the gala. You know, they're probably the Bayheims among the Bayheims closest friends, if not their closest friends up there. So, hmm. you know, I've met so many nice people through him, you know, so. Uh, he's a really loyal friend. You know, there, there are a number of other things I really admire. So I'm glad that I had a chance to say all of that uh, in front of a, that crowd while interspersing um, some 
some jabs along the way. What were some of the funniest stories? Maybe not, you know, if not yours, maybe PJ's or Gary Williams. Oh, you know, well, Rick Pitino went into the uh, the whole story of how he was supposedly hired by Coach Beheim on his wedding night. You know, that Rick, Rick Jim wanted to hire him and Rick kept leaving the wedding to go talk to Jim. And, you know, there was the story that's been told before, but there are probably more details in it in, in his telling of it. And then you can't go on your honeymoon because you have to go recruit Lewis or, you know, that was uh, – that was funny. Everybody was funny. You know, um, I, I saw Bobby Sansone forwarded me, I think it was an Instagram post from a former mayor of Rochester, New York. And he, he really summarized it. You know, it was hilarious. It was heartfelt, you know, it, but you know, people showed their respect for him and their appreciation of our friendship with him. So, you know, it was, uh, it was just a, as I said, I, I don't know how it could have gone any better. And, uh, everybody was really funny. I mean, there wasn't, you know, sometimes with those things, when you have six, seven, eight speakers, you know, there's the one kind of, uh, that wasn't so great, but, uh, <laughs> everybody was great. Adrian Autry got up and was terrific. He was very warmly received by the crowd there, you know, standing ovation. It's clear, you know, the, the people are solidly behind him. You know, there's, there shouldn't be any animosity toward him, you know, uh, and there is, you know. So uh, he's clearly a very popular choice. I, I think Orange Nation, myself included, uh, believes he's going to do a great job. Now, if if somebody was really on their game to roast Jim, I mean, you should have like walked up to the microphone and unzipped a jacket to reveal an Indiana Key Smart jersey. I, I... oh, now that's me. See, we we. Because that that would be a difficult memory for all of us. You know, that's one of those places where things I remember <laughs> where we were. You know, not and that we didn't hence, bring up. That's why I wasn't invited, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of focused on uh, some of the other you know things for which he's known. His occasional little battles with the student media, for which I had talked to him several times over the years, asking him not to do it. As a matter of fact, when I first got up there, the podium was a little loose. And the microphone was kind of rolling around. And one of my favorite Coach Beheim press conference things, and you were probably there, was when he got up one time and the microphone was squealing. It was making this weird feedback. And he just smacked it like, you know, like that's going to help. Like the TV when, when you were a kid, it was the screen was blurry. You hit the side of the TV, maybe it would fix itself. But, um, yeah, as you know, Mike, there's plenty of material um, to roast Coach. You know, they – when Julie many, many years ago asked me for the first time of about five or six now to come up and MC their big gala, their basketball that they have a turning stone for their foundation. She said, it's easy. You just have to get up and make fun of my husband for about 10 minutes in front of a very sympathetic audience that wants to hear you crush him, basically. So uh, I've had plenty of experience doing that. You've hosted the gala five or six times and you probably haven't had to tell the same story twice. No, no, there's always plenty of material. Um, you know, it's, we've had a lot of laughs. And I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine. I, I, I had a text from Adrian Autry the next day, you know, just I had told him how great it was to spend time with he and Andrea. Another one, you know, just like Julie Beheim, uh, Adrian's wife is a wonderful, wonderful person. Um, and we spent some time with them before and after. And I've spent time with them in the past as well. But looking forward to spending more time with them going forward. And, you know, Adrian, when he texted back, just said, I don't remember the last time I laughed that hard, you know, for that long. So, you know, it was, it was a really funny night. It would have been, you know, it's too bad. I don't know if anybody recorded it. It probably wouldn't have been a great thing to have recorded, but uh, I don't think anybody did. But I know the, the people who were there were really glad they were. I had so many people come up to me afterwards and say, you know, that was just amazing. It was special. You know, it was a really, really cool night. Tell and he deserves that. it, right? I mean, he yeah. deserves it for all of his uh, quirks and foibles and such, many of which were discussed at, at the roast uh, during the roast portion of the evening. Um, you know, he's, he's had a remarkable career. As I said, and I, other people echoed it, I'm not sure there's, you know, who's a more important figure, really, in the per in the history of Syracuse University or Syracuse, New York. You know, I mean, if you're listing the most important people who ever have been a part of those two communities, who's yeah. more important? 
right? So, I mean, there's a lot there to unpack and, and a lot to pay tribute to. And, uh, you know, as I said, for all of his, his quirks and foibles, which we all have, um, you know, he, at the end of the day, for me, he's been a remarkable friend and he still is. And that's the thing I appreciate most. He's a very, very loyal friend. And, you know, typical of Jim, there, he does a lot of nice things for people that he doesn't want people to know about. But, uh, you know, he's done a number of those things for me, that's for sure. Going back to smart, funny, and clever, I understand Jay Billis was supposed to have been there. That I don't know. I saw his name on one of the original emails, um, which I find interesting. You know, they, they've had their ups and downs, obviously. I, I refereed one of them pretty memorably, actually, a story I was going to tell the other night, and then it was a long story, and there were a lot of speakers, and... I kind of toward, turned toward Jim because I made a joke about, you know, which I've used many times that Jay was going to be there, but he's busy working on his new book called The Ten Greatest Men in History and What I Think of the Other Nine by Jay Billis. <laughs> um, so the uh, so the crowd got a chuckle out of that. But I, so I sort of turned to Jim as if to say, should I tell that story? He's shaking his head no, but. You, know, you remember when coach said something about the young man from Duke whose name escapes me at the moment. Yeah. And it, it, you know, and then Jay kind of went after you know, all Jim basically said was he thinks Duke's better without them, which I think a lot of people felt he was, even though he's a good player. And Jim didn't mean it to be a personal comment about I think whoever the young man, I can't remember his name. You so know, I'm uh out to right now. I'm yeah, it's saying. okay. Um but and so you know, Jay on game day within a day or two later you know, he kind of fired back at Jim. So that was game days on a Saturday. Jay and I were doing, well, actually, originally it was supposed to be Corey Alexander and I were going to do Syracuse at Duke two days later on Big Monday. I called Jay. I'm like, Jay, you have to do this game now because it's going to seem like, you know, you always do Big Monday. And it's going to seem like you're ducking this now with Duke and Syracuse and you're in the middle of this storm. So he said, already done. I already called ESPN. I told them, yep, I need to do this. So they wanted me to work with Corey because I was going to do the ACC tournament with him in a week or two after that. So they wanted us to have a little experience there, but that didn't happen. So anyway, um, so the night before the game, we went to the hotel and, you know, spent a lot of time um, hashing it out. You know, Jay and Jim have been friends for a very long. I mean, Jay, Jim recruited Jay to come to Syracuse and he obviously went to Duke, but um jay considered pretty seriously so the i thought we had the whole thing solved we had we kind of figured out jay and i how we we're going to handle it on the air so we came out of a tv timeout in the first half and we kind of rehashed the brief history of what jim said what jay said and so i led jay into it you know we talked to the coach last night you know and he really didn't mean anything personally uh, toward the young man he doesn't really even know the young man. And before I could finish the sentence, well, Jay came in with, well, of course it was personal. You can't say something like that and not have it be personal. And I was like, oh, my gosh. We just spent an hour last night. So, um, anyway, uh, Coach wasn't happy with the way that went. So, their reconciliation took a little while longer. And actually, I think it happened at my charity golf tournament months later when they were both there and at the function the night before. They talked and kind of hashed it out. Um, so I'm glad. So it's a long way of saying, you know, I, I think the relationship is fine. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that it is. And I think Jay originally intended to be there, but something came up. But uh, but I think they're fine. But Jay was not there. I, I, I would tell you, it's ab that really, I would bet absolutely the relationship is totally fine and probably was sooner than anybody other than Jim Beheim realized because. That's the way he's always been in my experience with him. Yeah, believe me, you know, he's been mad at me before quite often. Oh, I bet. Yeah. But it never lasts that long. And mm -hmm. once you get past the hash out part and, you know, or as soon as he gets his say, he's good. Um, but people who don't deal with him all the time don't often realize that. I remember uh, Andy Katz uh, way back in the day, one time had uh, Jim Beheim get mad at him. And the problem with Andy was, is he wasn't around the team as often. So he never understood that Jim's not mad at you anymore. Cause I would see him from time to time. And he's like, is Jim still mad at me? And I would be like, <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, we've all experienced that, right? He's been mad at me too. So, yeah. um, 
you know, and it's, it's understandable. And, and we're all that way. I mean, it's kind of one of the things that I admire about them. You know, a lot of us are annoyed by stuff. We don't say anything and we carry it around. And, you know, I have some people in my life who, you know, store things up and store things up. And, and then when they get mad, they get mad about things that happened a year ago, in addition to whatever just happened to trigger it. You know, I kind of like the people who react in the moment. And um, you know exactly what they're mad about. Yeah. And at least, you know, because, you know, do you remember a year and a half ago when you said blah, blah, blah? I was like, no, in all honesty, I don't. So, uh, you know, I appreciate it. Do I, do I wish, uh, especially with the students, he, he not been as, I don't want to say confrontational, but, and I told him the story at the end of the year, you know, he had one of those episodes toward the end of the season. And uh, I think it was the young journalist who asked about, one of the players wasn't there for a game, you know, didn't come to the game. Totally legitimate question, right? I mean, yep. needed to be asked. And and Jim swatted it down. So within a day or two, I called Jim and I said, Jim, you know, this is just another example. You know, there wasn't even anything wrong with the question. And Jim said, I told this at the roast the other day, Jim said, well, what you couldn't see, you know, on the on the video was the kid made a face at me while he was asking the question. <laughs> I don't care if he flipped you the bird, right? I mean, it's like, you know, you just can't respond that way, especially to a legitimate question, right? I mean, if it's really a stupid question, then go ahead, right? I mean, the kids are there to get trained for what the real world is going to be like. So the real world, sometimes if you ask a stupid question, someone's going to tell you that's a stupid question. You know, I get that from time to time. You know, when we meet with these coaches in advance of the game, you know, they'll tell you they don't really appreciate the question. So... I guess from that standpoint, it's good training. But I did occasionally remind coach that that student, he or she's uh, family, are, is paying seventy five thousand dollars a year for the right to get smacked down at a press conference by a Hall of Famer. Yeah, you know it was hey, a good a question. I tell you what, I was your life right. He got he got the words out of his mouth quicker than I could have. It was my first question too. Mm -hmm. Just you know, yeah, it was a totally legitimate question, um, but. You know, what again? sometimes that doesn't matter, you know. Oh, oh it's all good. It's all mm -hmm. good. Um, listen, it sounds like it was a heck of a night uh, at Oak Hill Country Club. Um, would have loved well, Jubilee to said it was the memory of a lifetime, right? I mean, to have all those people there, you know, a lot of their most, you know, their closest friends, I would say. You know, there were former players there. John Wallace was there, Roosevelt, Bowie. Uh, Eric Devendorf, the whole coaching staff, Juan Coleman was there. Um, you know, so I said close to 500 people is what I read, and, and I believe it. There were tables everywhere. Um, so, yeah, I don't, as I've said a few times, I don't know how it could have been any better. It was funny and heartfelt, and a lot of people who were really close to coach were there. And as he said, it was the best tribute any coach ever got. So, for him to feel that way, I think, kind of sums up what a really great night it was. Bobby Sansone and Jim and Peggy Carrick and, you know, the people at SU, Julie, everybody who kind of helped put it together uh, did a fantastic job. And credit to, you know, people like Fratello and Gary Williams and Rick Pitino from coming from distance to, uh, to speak. But they clearly wanted to be there, and they were very heartfelt, you know, not only in the appreciation of Jim as a coach, and, you know, they talked glowingly about – how he is one of the great coaches of all time, but also as a person, the way he interacted with them. Jim is very well liked within the coaching profession, you know, and very well respected. Yeah. As you know, as you've seen it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, Same. Mark Schmidt from St. Bonaventure was there and he was just there to support the event. Although I think he came to play at Oak Hill, but, uh, and there's a heck of a coach, you know, he's done a remarkable job at St. Bonaventure. Yeah. No question. No question. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like it was a great night. Uh, I would imagine uh, Jim's going to have a lot more of these kind of nights, uh, but it was great that somebody put it together. And my God, that is an incredible guest list. Um, you know, kind of reminds me of uh, we had the premiere of our documentary, Will to Win, uh, back in March at the Landmark Theater uh, with like all almost all the guys from the 2003 team there in attendance. Um, and also about 1,300 people. Unlike Oak Hill, not made, not, probably very few of them knew Jim. These were these right. all Syracuse fans that just wanted to be there. And, and the standing ovation he got that night, we, we also saw it. It was on video. It, it touched Jim. 
Right. It, it really got to him. It's it's kind of nice that he's getting to experience this uh, in retirement. So. Yeah. Well, as you know, you know, underneath that occasionally, I don't want to say crusty, whatever the right word, demeanor, but there's a very sensitive, emotional guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. and we certainly saw that side of it. And I, I will never forget the, the look on his face and the tears in his eyes when he walked in that room and saw 500 people who were there to honor him. And as he you know looked around, he saw you know, so many of the most important people in his life. So it was awesome. He deserves it. And as you said, I'm sure there are more of those types of things to come. Yeah. Well, Sean, thank you for joining me here on the podcast and taking me back to that evening. Um, Sound like a great time. I hope you still have a few uh, lines and some material ready the next time you're hosting the, uh, the gala. Well, you know, Jerry McNamara said to me, you know, just go ahead and use the same jokes because they're funny and people don't remember them anyway until you say them again. They're like, oh, yeah, that was funny. So a lot of these people have probably heard the same jokes uh, more than once, but it's always a great audience and they play along. And it was uh, it was fun to be there. As I said, it's uh, I looked out and I saw a lot of people who are my friends who I didn't know uh and I now know them very well. well people like Bobby Sanson and, and the Carricks and many others, you know, through Jim and Julie, they, they have a tremendous friend group uh, who love them very much. Awesome. Very cool. Again, Thanks, Sean, thank you very much. Can't wait to see you on a sideline at a game uh, this upcoming season. Looking forward to it. And uh, I know Adrian's going to do a great job with his terrific coaching staff and, you know, hopefully it'll be a fun season.